welcome back and happy Halloween. As you can see, I am in my Halloween costume. I am dressing as Audie this year. Um, Audie is not dressing as me. I cannot get the glasses on his little cat face and he keeps pulling the ribbons out of his hair. I'm very disappointed. Today, uh, we are going to talk about the things you need to consider if you want to do your reselling in person. And by that, I mean through a brick and mortar facility where people will come in, see your stuff, buy it, take it home with them, as opposed to online selling. So, before we even begin, I want to start by making it very clear I am not an attorney. None of the information I am presenting here today should be considered legal advice. Okay? So, as long as we got that straight, we'll be back in a minute. Well, this topic is the result of a question from a viewer, actually it was a suggestion from a viewer saying, you know, why don't you go over this because uh, this is, the viewer felt this would be interesting to some of you. Um, even if you are not planning to do this at any time in the immediate future, it might be worthwhile to give some consideration to what's involved. So, let's start with, is it worth your while to even consider this? So, let's take a look at what you would need in order to stock an antique booth at uh, an antique mall. Um, and we're going to look at your average smallish booth. Um, in a mall that, that may in fact be large or small, but you know we're focusing on your booth size. Well, for starters, you probably need about a hundred smalls. Now, when I say smalls, I'm talking about things like um, porcelain, vases, salt and pepper shakers, the, the kind of stuff I sell through my Etsy shop. Uh, those are small. They can usually get shipped out in a box that is roughly eight, eight by eight inches, or eight by eight by eight inches, yeah, cube. Um, you'd want about a hundred of them. You're probably thinking to yourself, my goodness, that sounds like a lot. No. You can probably put about 50 smalls on a single bookcase or display shelf. And if you are going to rent a booth, you're certainly going to have at least two bookshelves or some sort of display space for your goods. So you're going to want to think in terms of a hundred smalls. Now, if all you're selling are smalls, if that's the end of it, then you should probably consider online selling first. Because even though you will have shipping charges, they will be relatively small and you will not have a great deal of difficulty shipping your items out. An 8x8x8 box is very manageable. The booth will come in handy if you have a mix of things the smalls because those are things that catch people's eye draw them into your booth these are things that sell ordinarily relatively inexpensively for under twenty dollars and under twenty dollar price tags lure people into your booth but it doesn't make sense unless you have some larger items too so 
medium-sized items are things like lamps, um, uh, uh, cookware, um, linens, uh, larger pieces. And of course you get into specialty items like dolls and toys, um, that sort of thing. Medium-sized items, things that, that are too big for that 8x8x8 eight by eight by eight box. You're going to want to look at having at least 10 of those as uh, on top of your 100 smalls and probably about 10 pieces that are larger, like furniture, chairs, tables. And you can get into, you know, um, armoires, bookcases, uh, just huge pieces of furniture as long as you're staying within the physical space of your booth. Now, in addition to having your hundred smalls, your ten mediums, your ten furnitures, which will be larger, and that will probably very nicely stuff the average booth. You're going to need to look at display pieces. Now, if you're selling bookcases, well, you can use them to display your smalls. However, when your bookcase sells, Remember, you're going to have like 50 smalls to relocate. Also, you might want to consider a locked cabinet if you have very valuable little things. And everybody has to decide on their own what is a very valuable little thing. For some sellers, I've seen them put some very inexpensive things into a locked cabinet. You know, uh, five dollar items you know behind lock and key uh, I am assuming that is done because the items are very small very portable people could easily put them in their pockets and wander off and we'll get into that later because that is a harsh reality that has to be dealt with in terms of displaying your items, it's probably a good idea to have some shelving of some sort, be it a bookcase, a table, whatever, that is not for sale. Because, as I say, somebody buys your bookcase, you are suddenly relocating 50 sets of salt and pepper shakers or 50 little vases or 50 teacups and that that can be pretty disastrous if, in fact, you are not on site to deal with this at the time the item is purchased. Remember, you will not be staffing your booth in an antique mall. You will be renting space in a mall where they will provide the staffing, that is, the cashiers, the people that will help your customer get the bookcase or the curio cabinet or whatever it is they've just bought and displaced all your little goods and getting that out into the car. But in the meantime, you've got all your stuff that could very well be piled up on the floor where it's likely to get broken unless you are on the spot to deal with this. So consider carefully the value of getting some not for sale display pieces. That is an investment. And there's no two ways around that. That can be costly. Um, the idea of locked cabinets, that's seller's discretion. I've seen many booths that do not have locked cabinets. I have seen booths that consist of nothing but locked cabinets. So that's going to depend on what kind of security the mall has, what kind of customers they have, what the location is. It's very likely some malls, some areas, some customer bases are more prone to pilfering. Um, 
You need to find a mall. Now, how do you find your mall? Well, in general, we know where we shop. And if you're thinking about setting up at a mall, it's probably going to be a mall you have some familiarity with. You're going to want a mall that is located in a convenient area. You certainly will not do as well if your mall is located out in the middle of nowhere, unless, of course, it's very well publicized and they have a lot of traffic. It might be sort of a, a local attraction. They might uh, have a lot of tourist trade coming through. There are exceptions to every rule, but you want a convenient location. You want something that's very accessible, that has good parking, and preferably the sort of place that can draw in car traffic and pedestrian traffic. Because if someone has to drive to your mall, if that's the only way they can get there, you need to make sure your mall is sufficiently attractive to lure a lot of customers. Otherwise, you want something that people will be downtown walking around going from one store to the next and go into the mall. In order to determine how successful the mall is, you don't just take the word of the mall owner or the mall manager. You need to invest a little of your time in this. If you don't have the time, pull in friends, relatives, etc. and have somebody spend some time in the mall on a Saturday afternoon, on a Tuesday morning, whatever, and just get some idea of what the traffic in this mall is like. If this is the sort of place that doesn't have a lot of people in and out, if they're never really crowded or busy, you might want to rethink that particular mall and slide over to something where they do have more customers coming and going. Because remember, in an antique mall, everything is there. People go in and the other vendors who have been there longer than you have are going to have the prime locations already. You go in, maybe you'll get lucky and someone will have just left a prime location. However, the other vendors who are already in that mall may well have in their contract first dibs on those prime locations. Your location is probably not going to be the prime location. So you have to attract people with your stuff. You want a lot of people moving into this mall. The more people walking through the front door, the more potential customers available to you, the more eyes you can draw into your mall. So to that end, all your stuff you're going to want to make sure it's all clean and in good repair, that all of your prices are clearly marked, that every item has a price. Because if people pick up an item and they don't see a price, and the mall right across the aisle has everything clearly marked, they're going to walk away from your stuff and go over across the aisle. Everybody does that. It's human nature. People value their time. and they're not going to waste it dragging things around trying to get a price on them. So remember, you want to present well. This is, this is how you grab people, by what, what you are showing them. So make sure you know how to to present your items in the most attractive possible way. In general, all that means is clean, neat, orderly, 
don't make your customers climb over stuff. Uh, and that's another reason for having a good variety of items, because occasionally you will find people who are drawn to your booth because they're in the market for a chair and you have two chairs and they can see your two chairs from down the aisle. It's like, I'm going to go look at that. Then once you got them in there, then they start looking at that pretty little sugar and creamer set or the nice picture you have up on the wall. Uh, because remember, you're marketing. And in order to market, you just put your best foot forward. When you have decided on your mall, and mind you, these are all still first steps. You're going to want to talk to the owner or the business manager. What are the rentals like? Um, can you start off with a small space and move to a larger space? Is that going to be an option for you? Um, you're going to want to know what they cover. In other words, are they going to cover your goods against damage on their insurance policy? Or are you going to need to keep a separate policy for um, theft damage? What about errors? Somebody picks up that beautiful table you've got in the corner, brings it to the front of the store, the cashier looks at the price tag and says, oh, $10, when in fact, it's $110. Um, who's responsible for that? Does the mall have insurance to cover for errors, or will you need to be responsible for that? Somebody walks into your booth and cuts themselves on you know, something. Let's say they pick up a glass, they break it, they cut themselves, they are bleeding all over the place. Who is liable? That is something you need to establish going into the game because you don't want to find out that you are liable when somebody is on their way to the emergency room screaming for their lawyer. So all that should be handled in advance. A good mall, a mall that's been in business and has been reasonably successful for a while, uh, is going to have owners or management team that's already going to know all about this. They are going to have uh, a, an attorney who's worked out the, the rental contracts. You will not be the first person to ask them who is responsible if someone trips and falls on the carpet in your booth. So don't hesitate to ask plenty of questions. Um, also, you need to know what you can do in your booth. Can you hang pictures on the wall? Uh, a lot of antique booths have pegboard. They actively encourage hanging things on the walls. Great. Others, yeah, I got to wonder. I'm not sure they're, they're all that user friendly when it comes to hanging things from the walls. Um, are you going to put rugs uh, in your booth, or rugs that would be for sale? Uh, if you lay them out on the floor, you know, is the staff going to be available to help them move things? Because selling a rug that's on the floor is going to be a bit of an undertaking. So once you got all that, you're probably thinking to yourself, okay, do I need a business license? Do I need to incorporate a business? What about taxes? Well, in some cases, you won't need a business license because the mall will have a business license that will cover you. Now, and here's where it comes, comes to the legal issues. I am not an attorney. Let me say this again. This is not legal advice. For the most part, you will not necessarily need to incorporate a business. If the amount of sales is reasonably low, you know, um, 
a few thousand dollars a year. You can certainly do this without incorporating a business. You can, you can use your own uh, social security number for the taxes. So in other words, you're just doing business as, you know, uh, Annie's Antique Corner, you know, and that is something that you can do. You don't have to incorporate unless the mall requires it. If, however, the mall requires it, you feel you're going to do enough business to warrant the incorporation, you know, a, a, creating a business entity, how do you do it? Well, for starters, you do not need an attorney to do this. Uh, I incorporated my first business when I was 16. Yeah, let's face it, I mean, I was not, you know, the brightest bulb in the, in the box there. I mean, I was 16. What does a 16-year-old kid know? You can usually do this today even more easily. You go to your state's website and they will have something that will be called something along the lines of the Pennsylvania Department of State, the Nevada Department of State. And you can find incorporation forms right online. They're very easy to fill out. Furthermore, your state will have people who will help you fill out these forms. The process usually goes, step one is you choose a business name and you run a check to make sure nobody's taken that name already. Um, and then you can reserve your business name while you fill out your forms to get uh, your um, incorporation. Very, very simple in some states, a little more complicated in others. Regardless, it is a do-it-yourself job. You do not need an attorney to do this. But keep in mind, if your state has any sort of, you know, um, complex requirements, legal advice might not be a bad idea. You can go to online services like LegalZoom and they will send you incorporation kits where you just fill in the blanks. You just do it all on your computer. You fill in the blanks, submit that, and you're good to go. Uh, again, that is probably unnecessary because your state, as I say, will be happy to help you. They have people on staff who do nothing but help you work this out. So incorporating is not difficult. Once you've incorporated your business, you apply to the federal government for a tax ID number, um, uh, an employer identification number, they call it. It's an EIN. That is your tax ID number, and the mall that you're dealing with may, in fact, want a tax ID number. They may insist on it, um, and they may insist on uh, an EIN, an employer identification number. So, again, talking to the mall as a starting point is always going to be very helpful because you might want to start just as an individual doing business as, it's called a DBA, doing business as Annie's Antique Corner. And you sell a few items, you realize business is going to be bigger than you anticipate, scoot in online and get yourself a corporation, which in fact may not be Annie's Antique Corner because that name might already be taken. That's why you do your name search first. Remember, though, your state will have a vested interest in helping you do this because you will pay them a fee for this. Um, and But keep in mind that whether or not you go to your state for help, even if LegalZoom does it for you, 
you're still going to have to pay your state that fee. So you might as well get the most you can out of it. When you have your tax ID number um, and you're setting up your booth, uh, you are going to want to discuss insurance with a business insurance provider. The reason for this obviously is, and I, I so hate to bring this up, but it's a sad reality of life. Things get damaged, things get stolen, things happen, life happens. You know, tornadoes hit antique malls just as quickly and easily as they will hit trailer parks. So, do you ever notice that? Whenever there's a tornado in town, the trailer park is gone. So, protect yourself. Your stock, you know, the items that are in your store will probably have represented a considerable investment. Even if it's not necessarily a considerable investment in money, by the time you have loaded your antique booth at the mall, it will have represented a considerable amount of time in terms of uh, the acquisition of the items, the cleaning and prepping of the items, laying them out in an attractive way, putting price tags on everything, deciding what the prices should be. So you have an investment. Just because you may have picked up every scrap in your antique booth, from the local thrift store does not mean it's not really worth a great deal more than you paid for it. So talk to an insurance professional. If you are in a mall with security and many other little vendors and booths, your insurance premiums are probably going to be quite low because there's protection in numbers. Um, the antique mall will probably have security. They will have staff on on hand. They they may have um, they may have a location. For example, um, Black Rose, the place that Jocelyn and I went to in Chambersburg, is in like a shopping mall, where in addition to whatever security the Black Rose Mall establishment has. They have the greater security of the shopping mall, which meant um, you know, security people patrolling the parking lot, outdoor cameras, things like that. Again, all of these will keep those insurance prices low. But remember, you do have to protect yourself. So, if you've gotten this far, now what? Well, you have to create a presence in the mall. You need to drop by different times of the day, check on your booth, compare it to other people's booths, get your friends and family to do the same thing too, because it's a fresh pair of eyes. Which booths are jumping out at them? Which ones are enticing them to go in? How can you compete with them? They are your competition. They, they are your colleagues in that you are all sharing space and, and working it together in the same antique mall, but they are also your competition. So you want to stay on top of everything. You definitely want to check on your booth at minimum once a week. You don't have to go in every day, especially if, if it's well staffed and there's good security, but you have to be able to make your presence known. Go in, make sure the staff know that you're in there, um, rearrange tidy things up, replace missing price tags. People sometimes take price tags off things well. Okay, you know I do it when the markings are obscured. You may have to put price tags back on things, not over the markings, though. Remember, if you put a price tag over the markings, somebody like me 
for me. You know, it's going to go in there and, and just scrape that price tag off to see the markings. So be smart. But you do have to deal with things like this. Things get dropped and broken. Things get rearranged. Your things might have ended up in somebody else's booth and the staff may have just come in and dumped them on a table somewhere. You need to be present at least some of the time. So, hopefully this is enough general information to get you started. If you have questions, if there are things that you feel I should have mentioned or didn't mention, even if it's like completely off the wall, let me know in the comments and I will either respond through the comments or I will do a follow-up video if that's what it takes. So let me know. And meantime, good luck if this is what you're thinking about doing. I wish you all the best and I hope you do it in my area because I love new booths in the local antique malls. Okay, have a great day. I will see you all tomorrow.